Hey, what's going on guys? It's Brian from Men's Comics. Real quick, before we get into this video, I just wanna let you know that this Saturday, October 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern, friends of the channel, 616 Comics at the616comics.com are gonna have a brand new exclusive variant going up for sale. That's right, we are talking about Image Hit Series coming up, crossover, it just hit FOC this past Monday, but this Saturday, The616 Comics is putting up for sale their exclusive variant for it. It's gonna have two different covers for it, both by monster cover artist, Megan Hutchinson. Can't say enough good things about her. Her art is fantastic. It's gonna have a regular cover that's limited to 500 copies. It's gonna have a trade dress on it, but there's also gonna be a limited to 250 virgin variant that is gonna be available as well. So this Saturday, October 17th, 2 p.m., the616comics.com. Make sure you guys check it out. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian Jackson, Men's Comics, and we're here again to talk about those market trends within the comic community. That's right. This is that three up, three down. We're giving you three up trends and three down trends. Jack, how's your week so far? Great. It's busy. But you know what? That seems to be part of the course days. But, uh, you know, there's some stuff I'm excited to talk about on um, three up, three down, including one property you and I have been anticipating for quite some time. Yeah, we're not going to hold you in suspense. We're going to get right into it, starting with that three up. And the three up right now is that Simon Baz, Jessica Cruz. We got some HBO Max news, right? That's right. Now, if you guys aren't familiar, we've already got part one of a top five Green Lantern back issues to be on the lookout for video, which I'm sure Brian will go ahead and throw the link in the description, where we were already looking ahead to a potential HBO Max series. And we're going to continue that. We've got more books. And I would stay tuned for this week's top 10 list for sure to see what we've got coming up as far as Green Lantern stuff. But this news has been surrounding the characters that will be kind of like mainly featured in um, this upcoming Green Lanterns TV show. Now, we got several, Guy Gardner, Kilowog, Sinestro, but the ones that are moving uh, the books on back at the issue market, whether it's Instagram or uh, eBay, has been Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz. Um, and now, of course, with these characters, comics politics comes into play, uh, specifically with Jessica Cruz more than quite possibly any other character. But here's the thing, it really doesn't matter. Because this is why I hate comics politics, but this is why I also believe it's a really an irrelevant argument. Because guess which books are spiking, Brian? Which one? All of them. Yeah, all of them. Course. Yeah, all of them. It, it wouldn't matter. If you, if you had bought 20, you made money. If you bought 30, you made money. If you bought 31, you made money. It doesn't matter whether it's Greenland 20 or Justice League 30 or 31. You are incredibly profitable today as these books are trading for over $30 each. Um, variants even more, combo packs even more. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, and when you look at Simon Baz, the free comic book day issue is selling for about $15, which is incredible for a free comic book day issue that was plentiful. And I would be on the lookout. A lot of people are looking for stamped versus unstamped, but stores had basically stopped stamping at that point because they started to realize customers didn't want that. But what some stores did do who were say more than a thousand of a free comic book day book, they put their store logo similar to like a store variant for that free comic book day book. We've seen several of them out there. Now these are lower printed than the general say one with the white box that says free on it. I would be on the lookout for those. Those are rarer copies um, that could see uh, an increase in value over time. But either way, uh, everything Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz is hot right now. I could not be more excited for a Green Lantern television show that's going to kick some ass. Yeah, definitely hot. I feel like I'm experiencing deja vu from like, what was it, about five years ago when both of these were hot again? <laughs> yeah, and that's, the, and that's the one of the things I learned this weekend, right? Spec doesn't die. This is, this is 2014, 2015 spec coming back around and finally paying off to that kind of like full potential. Yeah, so making money, unless you're like me, I didn't list them then, I haven't listed them yet. But uh, either way, definitely hot. The next one we're talking about for the three up this week is, this is a series that we talk about a lot on this channel. We're talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We've talked frequently about the fact that Ninja Turtles always has their core niche audience, right? It's always there month in and month out. And every now and again, the general comic market comes on board 
and appreciates what's going on in the world of the Ninja Turtles. That has happened since issue 101 when uh, Sophie Campbell took over and we saw the introduction crazy, in 101. Crazy right in, now. Insane. We saw the introduction in 101 with the albino turtle, Lita. Uh, we also saw 102 with the introduction of the weasels. We saw with 105, Aloe Pex uh, joining the, the I think turtles. we had a video on and, that. And then, yeah, changing the name. We did. We definitely did have a video on that. Um, and again, that's, a, that's another one we can throw in the description. But we've been on top of this new run the whole time. Uh, you know, the change to the Splinter Clan. Uh, everybody's getting hyped about that one panel where they look ahead and see Lita in the future. Um, it's funny the things that people latch onto, but 105 is on fire. The incentive is on fire. 101 is just out of this world. Cover A, cover B. Yeah, the, the one in 10, print, especially. Uh, the one in 10 is is 100 plus. Um, yeah, it's like 300 or 400, 9 8. And four exclusives, I think, are the next thing to pay attention to. Jetpack Comics did an exclusive. Slabbed Heroes did an exclusive. Both of those books are completely undercover. Um, they're selling for like $10 each. And both of those books are books that I think are more limited than many of the couple on for more money. So um, that's something to pay attention to. But while all of that is going on, we also have record prices being paid for TMNT number one, second print, fifth print. All, 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 we're constantly getting notifications about records being broken with the Ninja Turtles original Mirage main series. And I think that this is kind of one of those things um, that uh, is something to kind of pay attention to is that there's a, a increase I think in the overall respect in the comics community for the Ninja Turtles and kind of their place within the comics realm or, you know, market. Uh, and, and if this continues to happen, I think some of the bullishness that we've showed on Turtles in general is only going to continue to pay dividends. And I know that there's naysayers out there. Um, certainly, I know my man from the, uh, the Weekend Update, Nico Esquire, uh, gives me a hard time all the time about my belief in turtledom but uh i really think that this is one that's going to pay off in the long run yeah and the last one we're talking about on the three up i remember not too long ago i think it was a few months ago we were waiting saying that hey picking titles on the foc show thinking this might be the one that brings them back and it seems like they're back right now we are talking about vault comics yeah i mean honestly like they were on the hot last year right uh, when we're doing the hot and yeah, cold. these savage shores and Right. We were talking about them. Uh, certainly, um, you know, Andy Tomberlin, uh, who is a regular contributor to our show, was constantly picking various vault titles. Um, and it, it's one of those things where they were on fire, but they lost kind of that that touch. And it happens with independent publishers because you have to keep that momentum going. And we talked, though, when they were kind of on the down portion of this show and we said, man, yeah, they're one great series away from getting back. Um, and uh, Autumn Node came out, got that um, kind of buzz going in the right direction. It was Those a pulp variants are nice. If people love the pulp variants, which I was really skeptical of when they switched from the Vault Vintage, I felt like, man, why ruin the best marketing thing you've got going for you? But shout out to the Wasser Brothers, shout out to Nathan Gooden, shout out to Tim S. Daniel, who clearly know more than I've got. <laughs> and that is these pulp variants are home runs and it's the nostalgia and the old school kind of like a worn look that's doing well but you know it's really got to be about the writing brown people are liking these series so we're we have two vault number ones coming up this week for new comic book day both are sold out at major retailers ahead of release um so this is that kind of sweet spot that we see indie publishers get into where all right now i've put two out, hits out in a row and now the market is anticipating i don't want to miss another vault release so they're grabbing them. And I'm really interested to see, Brian, how that's going to affect this week's last call show. Because this week on the last call show, we've got two vault number ones. So will this continued success of new vault number ones on new comic book day cause stores to have to order more of these vault number ones come uh, FOC time? That is going to be the question. Because right now, supply is not meeting the demand, which is why these books are selling out, going up in value, and being chased on the back to market. But let us know in the comments section what Vault Comics titles you are chasing. Are you chasing any of these new ones? Is there any of the back issue ones that you are gold for? I definitely know what Brian's favorite 
vault series is of all time. But what is your favorite vault series to check out? Are there any that you've got your eye on in the future? I still like Wasted Space. I knew it. <laughs> and these Savage Shores and Alien Bounty Hunter. There's a bunch of vault books out there. I, or great reads. But there's the three up. We're going to shift down into that three down portion. We just talked about indie publisher with Vault Comics. But one of the things that's down right now, especially with indie, is those indie production deals that we were seeing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if this is down as a market so much as I'm down on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, um, people keep trying to get me hype. One of the things that we, and I want to acknowledge that I have seen some of the, the comments that some of you have said on social media and things about things that you wanted to see on the up portion. And one, one, two of the um, publishers that people wanted to see on the up area of this, this show was Aftershock and Scout, who both signed production deals and essentially changed their companies from comics publishing companies to companies that are going to publish comics and then immediately produce them for film or television. Um, this change into like kind of a, a merging with a multimedia company is a newer trend. Um, and it's one that has, say like, if you go in like your key collector app, you're going to see the announcement and then you're going to see 10 scout titles, 10 scout number ones. So then you're going to see the aftershock announcement, you're going to see 10 aftershock number ones. So I think that's very indicative of the way the market is reacting to this. They're like, oh man, you got to grab these number ones because they all just got optioned by, by a, 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 a multimedia company. But that's not really the case because the company is now becoming a part of the, the publishing company. They have to then produce these into television shows or movies and then sell them to an actual movie company or television company that's going to be able to distribute these. So this still has another step in the process. And I'm not sure going exclusive to one production company for an entire publisher is really going to be the best option for them. And I'm not the expert in this, right? But, but I have never seen one of these deals pay out. Uh, we've heard many times publishers get linked to various production houses and it hasn't really uh, paid dividends. I mean, even major companies have done first look deals with things like Netflix or Disney, and you see how slow even those deals move, right? Because these companies are buying up IP. And so now you've got the production companies who are trying to get on it earlier, and I don't blame them. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's a good sign for the comics market in general. But I guess the point that I'm making is I'm not going to run out and grab every scout number one or every aftershock number one, trying to imagine that they're all just going to get made into movies or TV shows simply because these media deals were done. I don't think it necessarily moves the needle. It's, and it would also be one thing if you were telling me something like, you know, an individual property, like if they, we live that comes out this week from Scout. If you were to tell me, well, Hive Mind, a company run by Dinesh Shamdasani, who has put out The Witcher on Netflix and has put out Bloodshot with Sony. Um, if you're going to tell me that that company is working with just one title, we live, I'd say, okay, well, that's solid spec. But for an, a media company all together to work with a publisher, it just uh, kind of waters things down a bit. So we'll have to wait and see. It does not mean that nothing will come from this. There could be many of these books that pop in the end. It's just that with the information we have right now, I'm not going to go running out grabbing every number one. Um, and I think that that's probably a negative reaction to this um, kind of piece of news or information. Yeah, I mean, we always say price of a lottery ticket. So if you just come mm -hmm. Buy one at the price, you know, and hope it does. Well, then it's always your money. Buy what you like. That's what we always say. Me, I, I think Scout has some good stories, but I don't buy the comics for a production deal. But History of Violence, Road to Perdition, those are all comic books too, but I don't see those books doing too much. But who knows? Either way, next one we're talking about on the down right now is that new series from Dynamite. And it's called Die Namite. Right. And this is a series that we're excited about. Yeah. Um, so I don't want you to think that we're down on this series or the market's even down per se on this series. I think it's just I think the that buzz is down. It's a it, yeah, see, I don't and I don't, but I don't know if down is the word as much as it's just not, it didn't go anywhere. Right. It didn't, it never left the ground. It, it it's not that people don't like this. It's that I don't think people are aware of this. Um, and there's some 
factual reasons, which we've discussed on this show. Um, some of the things that happened surrounding the Comics Gate event with Dynamite Comics, which is the last thing I want to go back into right now, but it had an adverse effect on this uh, series, which was a major event going on. For, it is a major event going on from Dynamite Comics. This is a crossover of all of their characters. So you're talking about Vampirella, Red Sonia. You're talking about Green Hornet and Kato. Um, you're talking about uh, their characters um, who are like those golden age uh, um, characters whose rights have lapsed that they kind of reuse into stories. This was going to be an awesome uh, story set in the 40s featuring all of these characters that was going to kind of be like, or is got, is Dynamite um, their answer to like Deceased or Marvel Zombies. Uh, and everything about that seemed exciting, man. A crossover of all the characters, amazing cover art. There's some like, for issue number one, there's some like 10 Pichimoko incentives starting at one in 10 and working all the way up to like one in 50. So there's tons of reasons to be excited about this series, but they didn't get to do the panel at San Diego Comic-Con that they were supposed to do because Dynamite canceled all of their panels because the Comics Gate news had literally just hit that week and they didn't want to be bombarded with negative comments. I still think they should have put out their program and ate the comments, but what do I know? So they didn't. Um, the writer of the series, Declan Shelby, who's certainly a well-known mainstay writer for like Marvel and DC, he pulled out. So he's the writer on the first issue after that it's uh fred van fred van lent uh doing the rest of the series who you may not be familiar with but he is uh done stuff with um uh, valiant comics as well as he actually wrote some of the most recent marvel zombies so he does have some experience within that realm he co-wrote issue one he'll write issues two through five um but yeah this is a series honestly that should be red hot we should be talking about this with um the market's attention just based on the uh, incredible artwork, if you look at uh, Perio, uh, pseudonym, uh, you know, uh, there's a Batman homage. There's uh, just incredible covers uh, for this series. There's amazing store exclusives. We've got one on simplemanscomics.com as well as the 616comics.com from Justine Franny um, that we're real proud of, an amazing Vampirello cover. But it, it, at the same point, the market just is not aware of this book and kind of its significance. And it'll be interesting to see if people pick it up and read it because it's kind of been my speculation for a long time, Brian. I don't think people are really reading these dynamite books. I think that a lot of people buy them for the cover art alone. Um, so I think this is one they're going to need to read and, and get on board with this series to see if this thing can get the momentum back that it kind of never got. It, this one was like DOA, right? It just kind of didn't come out the gates. I like the Army of Darkness from Dynamite. <laughs> but I'm a huge That's Bruce right. Campbell fan. But moving on to the last one of the three down, what has happened with Doctor Strange spec? Yeah, I just think, um, I really think it's, it's because all of the books associated with Doctor Strange are Silver Age mega keys. Uh, and, and there's every reason to be excited about Doctor Strange. Strange Academy killing it in the publishing. Um, the there's excitement for Doctor Strange's next movie. Yeah, it's going to uh, be like a horror movie. Right. You, look at the, you look at the first movie, the first movie wasn't bad, but it definitely did not have the buzz of the other MCU movies. So, so normally I would think the sequel would be one that people wouldn't be really excited for. It, it's kind of like Captain Marvel 2, where like, it's coming, it's going to be good, I'm sure it's going to be good, but it wasn't one that people were like, oh man, I can't wait for Doctor Strange 2. And then they make the announcement about it, it involving the multiverse, it being a horror movie, and suddenly people were like, it got people's attention like Ragnarok. The way Ragnarok changed the tone of Thor, I think that this film is going to change the tone of Doctor Strange. Then we get the announcement that Doctor Strange is going to take up like the Tony Stark role of being like a mentor to Peter Parker in the Spider-Man series, which is amazing. And there's history of that in the comics. And even those comics uh, have started to spike a bit that relate to Doctor Strange working with Spider-Man. The problem is those are Silver Age keys. So I think the issue comes down to that, that Doctor Strange is priced out of so many collectors' um, kind of wallets. And we even looked on our top 10 list. We talked about like Doctor Strange number one, which is not the first appearance, it's not first solo story, yeah. but it's just the first number one. Um, and that used to provide value, right? Because you used to be able to buy that for like 75 bucks. Hey, it's better than the others. Now even that book is expensive. So I look today at like the modern young collector. If I'm a 14, 15-year-old collector and I'm coming up in the game, 
Um, and I want to get some Dr. Strange stuff because I really love this. Stuff. What am I buying? Where is the go-to Dr. Strange books? Um, and I think that that is going to be the question that we will have to answer um, because that's the thing that you and I are always doing is we're always looking at every collector in the marketplace and trying to find books that every collector can get excited about. And with Dr. Strange, it gets tough. It gets really, really, really tough. Um, so it'll be interesting because I, I'm bullish on Dr. Strange going forward. I think he's going to be a lot of what Tony Stark was for the early parts of the MCU. Well, I do know if uh, Tiva from Lords of the Longbox is watching this, he'll have plenty of books that he'd like to share with you. Absolutely. Yeah. He is the Dr. Strange uh, long-term spec guy. So for sure, I know Tivo is, is the guy to answer these questions. But there it is, guys. There's our three up, three down this week. Let us know in the comments what do you guys think's up, what do you guys think's down. This is Brian Jackson, Men's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.